Well, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Tom Mariello, and this is ForensicWeek.com. Well, this is the premiere show of an all-new idea that myself and my, and my co-host, uh, Kevin Dolan, that we'll talk about in a moment, uh, had to bring you content of information on forensic sciences that was real forensic science. We'll, we'll be using that word real uh, quite a few times. When I say that, I mean we're going to be talking to real uh, forensic scientists about what they do, how they do it, um, although we hope that our guests will be um, somewhat entertaining. Um, they, uh, uh, their focus is to educate people who want to learn more about uh, forensic sciences. Uh, our audience will certainly be diverse, I certainly hope it will be, uh, from uh, law enforcement officers, lawyers, who, uh, especially defense attorneys who, who need to uh, uh, understand uh, the evidence that's against their clients, uh, students, uh, from college students who are criminal justice majors uh, to high school and middle school students who are now taking forensic science courses here. A little bit about myself and then um, we'll uh, talk about uh, uh, the other folks and also this is a, uh, an open forum show today. Uh, we won't have any special guests. Uh, what we're going to be doing is telling you a little bit about how the show is going to be run uh, and uh, I have guests uh, all set up for the next eight weeks in a row. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about those guests uh, and you can pick and choose what's important. But remember, all the shows, as soon as the show is on, uh, ended at 8 o'clock in the evening, it will be uh, archived and you can go to it at any time uh, to listen to it. So uh, you can come at 7 o'clock every Thursday evening. Um, 7 to 8 uh, to watch the show live or you can uh, see it at your leisure. Uh, all the shows uh, will be archived so you can go to them uh, at any time. A little bit about myself, uh, you probably already know from my accident, ac not my accident, but my accent, that uh, I'm from New England, Boston specifically, um, and I uh, will be uh, uh, your, your host. Uh, I, um, don't mind me, telephone just worked. One of the things about these new webcasts that you're doing at home, uh, all the uh, interferences that uh, are normally happening uh, are, uh, are going to be there. Anyways, um, I've uh, been teaching at the University of Maryland for the last 35 years. I uh, just retired from uh, the federal government, uh, the Department of Defense. Um, uh, over the years, I've been a police officer, investigator, a polygraph examiner, forensic hypnotist, um, a number of things, uh, but the common denominator throughout my career in the 37, 38 total uh, has been education uh, uh, and teaching and, and communication. So this uh, webcast uh, format uh, certainly falls very nicely into um, what I've been doing all my life. and. Uh, they say uh, this is where TV is going in the future, this uh, opportunity to, um, to get content as you need it, when you need it. A little bit about my co-host, Kevin Dolan. Kevin is really the, uh, the man who uh, turned me on to this. Uh, he is the uh, proprietor of the Landon House a mansion in, and I want to make sure I get this, Urbana. Uh, Maryland, up near, uh, right off of 270 if you're from the Washington area in Frederick County. Anyways, uh, the uh, London, uh, Landon House Mansion is the General Jeb Stewart, uh, Confederate General um, uh, Mansion, where he hosted the famous fa uh, Sabres and R Roses Ball before the Battle of Antietam. Antietam. Anyways, Kevin uh, um, has created uh, a, 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 um, a venue uh, for for weddings and all different types of events in the mansion and one of his ideas was uh, to uh, start doing some training uh, uh, classes, workshops, etc. So this show uh, is uh, the beginning of, of educating on on the web but also we will be running a series of live training workshops at the historic land in the house in Urbana, Maryland and we'll be um, Telling you about that in the near future, the, uh, what the schedule is, etc. So uh, the reason why Kevin isn't here today is he's been down uh, North Carolina uh, all day. He, um, 
where he is uh, involved in a venture capital pitch to raise money for his new social TV network that he uh, plans uh, to run out of the uh, Landon House in, in this show, ForensicWeek.com, being part of that. So, uh, he and I will be the co-hosts uh, each week. Uh, I'd like to introduce you also um, our producer, Tim Fromm. Uh, Tim uh, is a student of mine this semester, and he will be working as the producer of the show each week, working with our guests, uh, making sure that they're ready up on Google+. Plus. We're using Google+. Plus. Uh, as the back uh, as the background to uh, broadcast this, uh, so uh, Tim, uh, please introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, so the audience will know what you look like and who you are. All right. Well, uh, as Tom said, I'm Tim Brom. I'm a senior at the University of Maryland. I'm in his uh, criminalistics class, and uh, I will be producing the show, um, making sure it runs smoothly on Google Plus, and. Uh, that's it? Um, you, you talk more in class, uh, Tim, yeah. <laughs> than you do in front of the camera. Anyways, Tim's a great student, uh, and not only is he a criminal justice major, but he has a, a true interest in radio and television and film, so this gives him a great opportunity uh, to uh, do a show like this. All right, uh, the format. This is going to be a talk show. You know, I, I, as I was scheduling guests, they, they were a little nervous. Oh, what, am I going to have to give a lecture? Uh, what am I going to have to say? And it's not that going to be. It's not going to be that kind of a show. It's going to be bringing guests in, talk show. I'll be asking questions. Uh, what the bottom line is? What I want to know is who they are, what is their background, what's their expertise, uh, when do they get called in in an, an investigation? Is it just for criminal cases? It is it is it for civil cases also? Uh, most importantly, is what is the type of examination they do how does it how is it done how long does it take to do and what is real versus what is hollywood we really want to make that distinction because it's very important besides the audience that i mentioned students and lawyers and law enforcement etc there's also the general public you the general public a lot of you from all over the country and i i, I know i have relatives up in uh, up in Massachusetts that are listening also from Everett and Malden, my cousins and my, my great cousins, my aunts and my uncles also. Uh, but whoever you might be, someday you're going to get a letter in the mail and before you know it, you're going to find out that your county has asked you to be a member of a jury. I have always defined a jury as 12 people who weren't smart enough to get out of jury duty. So if you're one of those people, uh, you're going to be asked to sit in and make judgment uh, on on an individual uh, in reference to their guilt or innocence, and it's going to be based on evidence presented to you. Uh, if your only knowledge of evidence is what you hear in the courtroom or what you see on television, then you're not always going to get uh, the, the the complete uh, scoop. You're going to get it here in ForensicWeek.com. You're going to be able to meet. Uh, experts uh, in all the different fields. You're going to hear them talking. Uh, if you have questions, uh, Tim, uh, Tim, tell them a little bit about how they can, while the show is on live, how they can uh, ask questions and that you'll be able to catch those and, and we'll be able to answer them while the show is still going on. Okay, yeah. So anyone who's watching the show on YouTube, uh, you can go ahead and comment on the video on YouTube if you have a YouTube account. and. I can see those comments as you comment. So if you have any questions for our guests or for Tom or myself or anyone, uh, just put it on there. I can see it. We can put it up on the show and we can address it. Okay, good. And that's really important. And also our guests. We can have up to 10 guests sitting in at any given time. Um, and uh, they'll also be able to uh, do their own chats for, amongst each other. So let me tell you a little bit about the schedule of of guests because again this show is to grab your attention make you interested in wanting to come back every Thursday evening. Next Thursday on uh, December uh, 6th we're going to have uh, Marilyn London a good friend and colleague of mine she's a forensic anthropologist uh, and uh, her focus is on um, bones and what they tell us uh, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about her expertise in a moment. The following week, December 13th, Dr. 
Prior Benergy. Benergy, I'm sorry. Prior Benergy. She's a former student of mine. And, and it was approximately uh, 2000, she was an undergraduate student. She left the University of Maryland, went to uh, University of Maryland uh, Medical School. Uh, she is a, a medical doctor. She's a pathologist. Uh, she just got certified as a forensic pathologist, and she is now an assistant medical examiner in the state of Rhode Island. A wonderful student, a wonderful person, a wonderful colleague, and very excited about being on our show on the 13th. And she's going to tell you about death investigation. What is it that the forensic uh, pathologist, the medical examiner, can really tell us uh, when they're involved in their autopsy? Uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about the difference between an a, me a medical examiner that she is and, and a coroner. We still have the medical examiner slash coroner systems in this country and there is a difference between uh, the two. A medical examiner being uh, in, a, in a, um, an appointed position by the government, either the state or the county. A, a, a coroner um, is, a, is a politician, is an elected official that doesn't necessarily have any background in forensic pathology. In that case when they're not, they could be funeral director, they could be anybody from any walk of life. In that case, they will hire contractors, forensic pathologists, to do uh, autopsies for them. So we'll talk a little bit about that in the role they, uh, role they have. It's very important that you know that the medical examiner uh, represents the deceased. Their job is to ensure that the circumstances, manner, and cause of, uh, of, a, of a person who died from some unexpected, unusual circumstance is, is properly adjudicated, and that's what they're, uh, that what they're there for. Okay, December 20th. Now, this is tentative, um, and, and if he's watching tonight, he's going to say, hey, uh, you jumped the gun, but I'm not going to, uh, I'm going to mention it anyways. Uh, a good friend and colleague, Dr. J. Tobin, uh, he is a, uh, a retired forensic chemist from uh, the Maryland State Police, but he is a professor at Stevenson University. Uh, here in the Baltimore County area outside of Baltimore City. Stevenson University is, has a wonderful forensic studies program and uh, on December 20th, if in fact uh, Jay can make it, I'm going to meet with him next week and talk a little bit about it. And I really hope he and maybe some of his colleagues uh, can talk about the university but he, because again, there are a lot of people out there that are interested in forensics, not sure how to go about it, what should they major in, what kind of courses are they going to have to take? What kind of courses should you be taking now in, in high school that will help you prepare you for that? Or undergraduate school, if you're, if you're finishing up your undergraduate uh, education in chemistry, biology, criminal justice, whatever, and now you want to get your master's degree and you want to now focus in the forensic studies, um, what do you need to do to prepare yourself? So. Um, if we can get Dr. Tobin in as a guest on the 20th, um, I would ask him to tell us a little bit about uh, those kinds of things uh, to focus your attention on your careers for the future. All right, December 27th, a couple of days after Christmas, a good friend and a colleague, uh, uh, Paul Woody. Uh, Paul Woody is a computer forensics expert. He deals with computer and network system security. Uh, he is a uh, a longtime teacher uh, in, in the Department of Defense. He teaches training courses in identity theft, viruses, m malware, and cyber intrusions into critical infrastructures. I got to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, there isn't a crime that happens today where a computer or, or some cyber has some cyber association. And it's vital for investigators today and certainly in the future to have a good understanding of that. They don't need to be uh, technical, but they have to understand. I tell my students that uh, I'm not trying to make sci uh, scientists out of them because many of my students are criminal justice majors that want to focus on the practical aspects of investigations and forensic sciences, but they do need to understand the capabilities of science. What can science do for them? Uh, what information can they provide? And most importantly, the the scientists in the crime lab can't help anybody unless the right kinds of evidence are presented to them. The scientist is not at the crime scene. Maybe on television we tend to see forensic scientists at the crime scene work in the crime scene. That doesn't really happen. 
the forensic scientists are in the laboratory examining evidence. So the investigators, crime scene investigators, evidence technicians, whatever they're called in your jurisdiction, they need to be able to understand, be able to properly record a, a crime scene, um, understand what evidence looks like, um, how to package it. Believe it or not, if you package forensic evidence, scientific evidence incorrectly, you can destroy it by the time it gets to the, to the, to the, um, to the laboratory. So really important there. So Paul Woody, uh, I've already talked to him. Uh, December 27th is the day we'd like to have him um, uh, over there. January 3rd, this should be an interesting, uh, a very interesting uh, uh, show. I'm inviting a number of high school teachers that are chemistry or biology teachers who throughout their careers have been teaching chemistry or biology. That's their interest. But in the last several years, because of the what we call the CSI effect, I guess, uh, they've been asked by their counties, by their uh, school systems to teach forensic science. Uh, and um, although they're, you know, they're, they have the science background, the forensic background has been somewhat difficult, and, but I'll tell you, I've been very impressed. I've been asked to, to be a guest speaker in a lot of high schools, not only in, in Maryland here, but also even in Massachusetts, because I have several uh, several personal friends who are teaching forensic science up at uh, my hometown, uh, Malden High School. Uh, anyways, um, these folks do a wonderful job. They work hard at trying to uh, gather whatever knowledge they can. So what I thought I'd do is I'd invite several of these teachers, not only from Maryland, but also some from Massachusetts, to talk about um, what kind of students they have um, taken their courses. Uh, what is their interest? Uh, what can we, in the uh, not only in the universities, but what should the law enforcement agencies in the crime laboratories, what should we be communicating back to the high schools uh, in reference to preparation for these students? So uh, I've got a number of, of teachers who already said they're interested. Some are more willing than others. Uh, but Emily Moore, the teachers at the Roosevelt High School in uh, Prince George's County, Maryland, said she's willing to come. And I, I've been at her class a number of times, and she does a great job. Uh, Terry Bradford from River Hill High School in uh, Howard County. She's been, uh, to my knowledge, she's been teaching it the longest around this area anyways. Um, I've been there a couple of times and I've had several of uh, people who work for me come to visit in her class. So she utilizes a lot of the experts around here. Uh, so we have a, a couple of others that we're going to ask uh, and that will be tentatively on December 3rd. December 10th we're going to have a firearms identification class. When I say that, I mean understanding the different kinds of guns and the evidential value that the uh, weapons have. Different kinds of guns from revolvers to semi-automatics to automatics to uh, assault rifles. These various weapons leave different kinds of evidence behind at the crime scene. It's vital for uh, practitioners, investigators to to understand uh, what is the evidential value of certain kinds of guns. What kinds of questions do I need to ask? What do I need to look for at a crime scene based on what kind of gun? If there is no gun there, but there's a lot of ammunition, what does that ammunition tell me in reference to what kind of gun I'm looking for? I remember during the sniper, the Washington sniper case uh, a number of years ago, um, the first uh, uh, several killings um, all they had was the, uh, the projectiles, the bullets that um, caused the death of, of, of the first several uh, victims. Uh, the, uh, the firearms experts were able to examine those and determine what kind of gun they were looking for. And, that, and, and not only that, when they started examining the spent bullets, bullets, when you hear the word spent, it means it's been already fired. Um, they were able to look at the individual characteristics of those bullets and determine that the same gun was being used. Now, it's easy to say that, and uh, on television and some of the Hollywood shows, um, they, they may show you a picture and you're not really sure what you're looking at. But on uh, December 10th, everything works out well, and I have a, um, a guest that I'm 
I'm, I'm hoping is going to be able to come. I'm not going to mention his name yet because uh, uh, we're, uh, we're working on getting him to do that. But he's been a guest in my class uh, since, uh, since the beginning of time. I've been teaching for 35 years, and he has been at every one of those classes. So December 10th, if you want to know and understand about firearms identification, tune in. If you are a, a gun enthusiast, and you, uh, let me tell you something. The guest I'm going to have here, I have never seen anybody ask him a question about firearms, etc., that he wasn't able to answer, or at least know, tell that person where to go to get the answer. So I think you'll enjoy that. Uh, so January seventeenth. Yes. I just want to. You were saying December tenth. I want to clarify. So January tenth, right? I'm sorry. Thank you. That's why I have Tim here. Thank you, Tim. January tenth, and that's 2013. Don't forget. Okay, we're near the end of the year. Thank you. Uh, January 17th, um, the last one that um, I have tentatively scheduled, we're going to talk about the polygraph. Now, uh, some people refer to the polygraph as a lie detector. I never do. I personally think there's no such thing as a lie detector. The polygraph uh, isn't that either. Uh, it's important that uh, the general public know and understand what it is. We're going to talk about the polygraph in, in two ways. One, the polygraph is used as an investigative tool uh, to uh, question or interview suspects. And, and that's used um, th throughout the law enforcement community. More importantly, the, uh, the intelligence community, the national security community, uses the polygraph in a large percentage of, of law enforcement also as a screening device. Uh, when they're hiring um, uh, employees, are um, uh, granting clearances. Uh, so in many cases, especially in the federal government, a, a screening polygraph uh, must be uh, taken uh, and uh, you must uh, successfully uh, get through that. So the more, it's my opinion, um, the more you understand uh, the polygraph, the better subject you have. Um, in the early 80s, I, um, I was assigned a polygraph. Uh, I spent about three and a half years here. I did a little, little over a thousand cases when I was there. The last three years of my um, my tenure as a government employee, again, and I retired this past February. Last three years, I was chief of polygraph for my uh, organization. I had up to 70 examiners uh, involved in, in most of what they did, in fact, was uh, screening tests. So uh, I'm going to talk about that. Um, I'm hoping to get a couple of uh, uh, guests from a lawyer who represents people who have difficulty getting through the polygraph to uh, a person who sells polygraph instruments here in the United States uh, uh, to, of course, uh, I'm an examiner, I have been an examiner, and uh, we might have one or two others. So that's uh, January 17th. So those are the uh, eight shows that we have uh, scheduled and a uh, little bit about um, Marilyn London. I'm really excited about her being our first guest next week. She is uh, an amazing person. Uh, she and I have done, we did a TV show on, on a cable network. My God, it must have been 10 years ago, and that show is still being, being shown all over the country. Um, but anyway, she is a forensic anthropologist. Uh, 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 amongst that, she is a, a skeletal analyst for the uh, Smith, Smoney, Smith, excuse me, Smithsonian Institute. Uh, she's uh, a forensic anthropologist for the U.S. Department of Health and uh, Human Services. She's a member of the National Disaster Medical System. Uh, those are the folks who go out on uh, major disasters like 9-11 disasters, uh, plane crashes, etc. She's been doing that since January of 1998. She's a consultant in the area of forensic anthropology. Uh, consultant over the years, she's been a consultant for the Office of Medical Examiners for the state of Rhode Island, and uh, um, we'll be talking to Rhode Island uh, in a few weeks. Uh, she also, the Office of Medical uh, Investigators for the state of uh, New Mexico. And she's a teacher. She's a teacher at the University of Maryland, for the Department of Anthropology. That's where I first met her in 1998. She also teaches at George Washington University. She's also an instructor for the National Museum of Health and Medicine, the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology. Uh, so she is an amazing person. Uh, she's a member of the uh, American Association of Physical Anthropologists. Uh, she's a fellow at the, for the American Academy of Forensic Sciences. 
She's written numerous publications uh, and given numerous presentations, and we're honored that we're going to have her with us next week. Well, one of the things we're going to do uh, on the show is we're going to keep a section for things that are happening um, in the past week in forensic sciences. For example, I'm going to have a student uh, as an intern uh, that's going to be responsible for doing research every, every day uh, for X amount of hours looking at what's new in the areas of forensic sciences and investigations. Now part of the reason is uh, they'll be doing that research, writing abstracts, and we'll be putting them, posting them up on my uh, blog. By the way, the blog to my company, Forensic IQ, uh, I always invite you to go to my, uh, my website. In fact, if you look um, uh, at my, uh, uh, hey, Kevin, do I have my uh, lower third there? I'm not Kevin. I mean uh, yeah. Tim. Yeah, yeah. I do. Okay, yeah, very no, good. Look real good. Okay, all right. I'm sorry. Um, t you know, Tim, Tom, Kevin. I'm gonna. Right. I'm gonna. I'm gonna get them all mixed up. Right. Anyways, um, uh, we're gonna have that student as soon as I pick him uh, for the next semester. He'll be giving a five-minute uh, up-to-date thing on what's new, what's happened in the past week in forensic sciences that we need to know. Something really interesting happened. Um, a show was on uh, the ID, the, uh, the Investigation Discovery uh, Channel this past week called My Brother the Serial Murder. If you haven't seen it, you got to look it up. It's about this guy, uh, Glenn Edward Rogers, who's a serial murderer. Uh, he alleges that uh, he uh, has killed upwards to uh, 70 uh, or so women. Uh, since uh, since around since the 70s, actually, um, he was arrested in Kentucky in 1995. He was ultimately sentenced uh, and convicted for uh, one of the number of uh, of, of um, murders that he was suspect in uh, that occurred. Uh, in Tampa, Florida. So he was uh, sent sentenced to death um, in 1997 in Tampa, Florida. He's sitting in, on death row right now. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, his brother, Clay uh, Rogers, uh, narrated a documentary on the ID channel where he says that uh, in 1994, he was working as a house painter in L.A. California, and uh, he actually knew Nicole Simpson, O.J. Simpson's uh, wife that was murdered, and that uh, he's saying now, of course, uh, somebody getting ready to be executed can say just about anything they want to say, but he's saying that he, in fact, was responsible for killing uh, Nicole Simpson and Rob, Ron uh, Goldman. Um, you know, Take it for what it's worth. Uh, um, Pat McKenna, who was, who was a Simpson uh, defense uh, investigator, uh, was on the show, said that there was a witness who saw a Ford F-350 uh, truck white in color uh, during the time in question. And so happens uh, Glenn Rogers had a white truck during the time in question. Uh, a uh, criminal profiler, Anthony, uh, Mioli interviews um, Glenn Rogers during the show and has in the last several years and they present a lot of information uh, of course he alleges that uh, that OJ paid him to go break into Nicole's house and uh, steal uh, these earrings that were worth twenty thousand dollars and that uh, when he went to do that uh, things went awry uh, or I, uh, Ron, Ron Gol, uh, uh, Goldman appeared, he had a knife, he killed him, Nicole came out, he killed her. At one point he alleges that O.J. was there at the time, which would explain the Bruno Mali shoe prints. Uh, so anyways, uh, it'd be interesting, uh, I'm sure it'll be on again, it's been on twice, uh, so check the ID channel for, again, the name of it's My Brother the Serial uh, Killer, uh, and see what you think. Uh, it's very interesting that at the end of the show, 
it says that the LA uh, County District Attorney's Office and the LAPD has not looked into these allegations. You know, I got to say, you know, I know they believe they they found the killer, and I wouldn't argue that. Uh, but uh, it's kind of interesting to listen to what he has to say. He certainly has the ability to kill. Uh, that's fact. Uh, there's a number of jurisdictions that. Uh, 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 have evidence to prove that he was involved. In fact, he's he's admitted to a number of other murders also. If I was L.A. Uh, County, I would certainly at least look at this, consider it. Is there any physical evidence still available that may associate with uh, putting uh, this guy, uh, Glenn Rogers, at the scene? You never know. Nothing mentioned, nothing game. So something to consider. I want to mention uh, our association, uh, the ForensicWeek.com association with uh, Craig Chip and the Hangout10.com uh, um, organization. Uh, Forensic Week is a proud member of the Hangout10.com live TV webcast network. Hangout10 is a series of shows that are recorded and broadcast live using the exciting, uh, and I, I got to say, exciting uh, Google uh, Plus Hangout feature that we're using here. A lot of capabilities, and the, and the cap excuse me, the capabilities get more and more. So thanks to Craig Ship and uh, in, in, in enticing people like myself and, and Kevin to uh, come up with new content, new ideas for new shows. Uh, I realize this is a little rough around the edges this show today, but I guarantee you, uh, as we get more comfortable with it, um, it'll 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 get a whole lot better uh, in reference to the kinds of things that um, we think uh, are going to be important for you to hear about. Uh, cold cases. One of, the, one of the things that I'm involved with in Forensic uh, IQ Incorporated is, is doing cold case investigations. And uh, I, I did want to mention to you that um, my, not only myself, but a team of student interns um, that I have working with me are involved in a cold case uh, that's uh, uh, occurred back in 1919 in Jeanette, uh, Pennsylvania. My students, David Miller, Brittany Shu, and Carrie Wells, um, all students uh, at Maryland. Uh, Carrie's a student at the University of uh, Baltimore. Anyways, we, uh, we were asked to conduct this investigation by um, a, uh, a person, uh, um, Ruth Ann Monteleone, who uh, contacted me. She is a granddaughter of uh, the, um, the one of the victims and niece uh, of the other victim uh, that uh, act were murdered by an uncle, actually, a family member, back in 1919. Uh, interesting case. Um, the people, uh, the, the members of the family who are alive today lived most of their life not even knowing what happened to their grandmother and aunt. A second um, aunt uh, was shot, but she did not die. Uh, she actually lived through uh, bullets, uh, bullet wounds that she had. Interesting enough, she, uh, she lived to be, I believe, almost 104 years old. Anyways, before she died, she decided to tell uh, the descendants, uh, the people who uh, were still alive, that, hey, you, know, you need to know what happened to your grandmother and your aunt and me, and she told them. Uh, so Ruth Ann and her and, and some members of the family uh, about uh, last year finally decided to go to Jeanette, Pennsylvania and see if they could find out what happened. And uh, they really couldn't find very much. Uh, one of the things we learned as investigators is uh, documentation wasn't very good in the early 1900s, uh, uh, probably because they didn't have the technology that we, we have today. But um, the only thing they could find uh, was that uh, a couple of newspaper articles that verified or at least said um, that um, Anna Son, uh, the grandmother, and Mary Sylvester, um, her daughter, in uh, in a uh, in a, uh, a niece um, of uh, Ruth Ann, um, were killed by Mary Sylvester's uh, husband, Joseph Sylvester. So. Uh, and all they knew, and all, the only facts they had were from two articles from that week, uh, and that was it. Uh, they worked very hard to try to find the bodies that are somewhere buried in, in a local uh, cemetery. So last week, myself and my team uh, 
we went to Jeanette, uh, talked with the district attorney and the coroner and, and the sheriff, and uh, it was an interesting thing. You know, one of the things we learned, you know, when you're conducting an, an investigation, you got to be careful not to um, place the values that you have in the present in something that occurred in the past. Uh, we kept having difficulty um, recognizing that the way things were in 1919 and where they are today um, are, are quite different. So uh, what we did find was there was an inquest. There actually was an inquest within the same week that the, the uh, murders occurred that uh, the coroner's office did uh, determine that uh, both Anna San and uh, Mary Sylvester, uh, the manner of death was uh, homicide by a gunshot. And it indicates in the, um, in the document that we were able to find that uh, it recommended, which was kind of interesting, it recommended that Joseph Sylvester, who uh, they believed was responsible for the shooting, uh, be apprehended. Well, we don't know what happened to Joseph Sylvester, uh, Sylvester as of this date right now. Uh, nothing, nothing in the newspapers anymore. Uh, my, uh, myself and our students, we went through two years worth of microfilm. Uh, we looked at the names of every person who was arrested uh, in uh, Westmoreland County, which is where Jeanette, Pennsylvania is. Uh, we looked at every, the names of every person arrested for from December of, of 1919 through the end of the year of, I think, uh, 1921, and no Joseph's arrest. There's no death certificate. So we don't know where what happened to him. Uh, and we're not done yet. We're still looking. We, we have a few more leads to uh, uh, to run to see if we can find out where they are. So, uh, Ruth Ann, if you're listening, uh, hello. Again, uh, I look forward to uh, meeting you uh, in the future. I had the honor and the pleasure with my students to also meet um, a distant cousin of, uh, of Ruth Ann's, uh, uh, Dorothy, uh, and her husband, Paul Vitolo, who still live in uh, uh, Jeanette, uh, Pennsylvania, who uh, uh, certainly uh, um, are looking for the same answers to the mystery of their family also. So that uh, uh, we will continue. Uh, I'm looking at a couple of other uh, whole cases that uh, we're going to engage students in. Uh, and uh, it's an opportunity uh, for them to, uh, to utilize what they've learned in their classroom and put it in a real situation. So in reference to, okay, so we're going to bring these guests in uh, uh, from different fields, and what are we going to ask them? What are we going to get out of them? I think you need to know because you got to decide tonight if you're still listening, and I hope you are. You know, do I want to tune in next week and the following week? Uh, as I've told some of my guests already, I want them to explain the expertise, the field in which they represent. What is it? What does it mean? Um, what do the words mean? Um, how do their expert? How do they assist the investigation? When do they get asked to even assist an investigation? Are they part of a, uh, the regular staff of a crime lab, or are they a consultant? For example, an odontologist, a forensic odontologist, is a, a dentist who, who examines teeth and jaw to determine uh, personal identification. Well, crime labs don't need a full-time forensic odontologist. Uh, so it could you could have your own family dentist. Your own, your own family dentist could be a forensic odontologist who has spe been specially trained to know those areas and is on a contract with a local crime lab to do that. So we'll find out how that works. We're going to discuss some of the technical uh, examinations conducted. And when they're talking about some of the, um, the technical examination processes, the the instruments or the uh, whatever processes they're using. We're going to talk about what it looks like. We're going to try to bring in uh, photographs uh, so you can see some of it uh, and also determine uh, how long did it take. Then, what's important, I don't want to le let any one of our guests come in without saying, uh, how did they get into the field? This is really important. Uh, because of the CSI effect, people have gotten a misunderstanding of of what a forensic scientist is and how you, how you get there. So it's really important to know these experts, what did they major in in college? 
at what point did they decide they wanted to be a forensic scientist in whatever field they wanted to? When they made that decision, what did they do then? What kind of um, postgraduate training did they get? Where did they go? Are there uh, special universities who specialize in that particular area that a student might want to consider? Uh, did courses they took in high school, in undergraduate, did that help them? If they had it o to do it over again, would they have had a different major to get to where they are today? Those are the questions that I, I really think are important. So uh, suggestions for students and future aspirants that want to get into the field on how to plan their careers um, are what we're going to focus on uh, before we, we let any of these people uh, leave. Okay, now I want to You're gonna have to. You're gonna. Uh, I'm gonna do a screen save, my friend. And this is a, something new for me. And um, can you see that slide? Slide, Tim. Yeah, it's looking good. Yeah, there you go. There it goes. Okay, good. All right. Well, this was our the slide that we were gonna start off the show with. Uh, but uh, in the future, uh, Tim tells me he's gonna have something fancy, fancy with snapshots and music and everything else so we'll see how how Pretty tim good. does Rem tim has to always remember that his grade is in my hands at all times is that right Ken tim uh, that is very right that's right okay all right so let's make sure we understand what forensic science is for those of you who are in this field i appreciate uh, your patience but there's a lot of people who don't know the word forensic sciences is about law and science and utilizing these two general fields to find the truth. It's all about finding the truth. And there are a lot of different definitions. For example, the word forensic is defined as applied to law. So if you put the word forensic in front of any science, what that means is that particular science, that forensic science, whether it be forensic odontology, entomology, uh, anthropology, whatever it is, it means that that particular field of study focuses on examining things that ultimately can or could be evidence that would be litigated in a court of law. That's all it is. So if an uh, anthropologist ultimately decides that they're interested in working in a crime lab and they want to focus on that kind of examination, then what they need to do, if they already are an anthropologist, then they need to take some law courses because it's important for the scientists to understand the application of their, the results of their examinations and how the courts need to accept it. So forensic means applied to law. It also is the science of analytic comparison. You know, everything that a crime lab does is compare knowns with unknowns. Um, an unknown is usually a piece of evidence that we find at a crime scene or on a person or on a suspect or somewhere. Um, a known is a standard. For example, if, if I believe that a certain gun fired a bullet that uh, caused the death of, of our victim, then I have to take that gun in the laboratory and I have to test fire it and make uh, to, to have a known. We know that this bullet came from this gun. So we can see the, the class and individual characteristics that come out of this gun, and then we will compare it analytically with the evidence that we have either in the body or on the, at the crime scene, etc. So that's why we call forensic science uh, the science of analytic comparison. The science of circumstance, that's another interesting definition that we find in, in textbooks. You know, circumstances. For example, a forensic uh, pathologist, a medical examiner, their job is to determine the causation of death. Now, a pathologist studies the causation of death. A forensic pathologist is one that studies uh, the causation of death through suspicious or unsuspicious uh, circumstances. In other words, it wasn't expected to happen. For example, a person went to bed um, perfectly healthy, and the next morning we find him dead. Or, or we find him uh, at a scene uh, um, uh, with trauma, etc. Wasn't expected to die. 
Uh, so because of the unusual circumstances, um, we have a forensic pathologist that will look at that. So that's where that uh, circumstance comes. Concerns with the unlikely and the unusual. Again, obviously, um, anybody who's victimized by a crime would say it was unlikely and certainly unusual. Uh, those who've been victimized, uh, they always, the first thing out of their mouth uh, uh, upon being victimized is, I, I can't believe this happened to me. I never expected it to happen to me, uh, and, 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 it, and it just does. Uh, forensic arose from the Latin word forensis, translated to speak the truth in public. In fact, a lot of us who've been around for a while may remember the forensic debating teams that we had in high school. Uh, when I was growing up, when I heard the word forensic, I associated it with debating teams. And that's what they were, you know, uh, speaking the truth in, in public, in, you know, with arguments, etc., in a competition uh, style. So uh, that's where a lot of people uh, remember that. I got to be t honest with you. I still have my textbooks from Suffolk University in Boston. I was an undergraduate from 1969 to 1973, and I still have them. You can go through these criminal justice textbooks, and nowhere in those books would you even see the term forensic sciences. It it wasn't there because it wasn't there wasn't a focus. The focus back in the in the 60s was still on on um, testimonial evidence, getting confessions from people, and there was a, less of a focus on um, getting uh, the uh, the truth from from physical evidence. Another definition: the application of scientific knowledge and techniques to the legal matters that follows, implicating the guilty, exonerating the innocent. Absolutely. The archaeology of the near past. I like that one. This is a slide I use in my class. So again, hopefully that gives you a little bit of better understanding of what forensic science is. Now, as a professor, I always have to discuss a little bit about history. We're going to do this very quickly. We have a few a few minutes. And just so you know where this all started, uh, the idea of using science to investigate crime happened in the late 1800s. Uh, um, we have a gentleman named Hans Gross in 1893. He was an Austrian prosecutor and judge. He was the first to suggest the use of physical sciences in the field of criminal investigation. So we started hearing it really in the, in the late 1800s. Then there was a gentleman in France, Edmund Lockhart, in 1910. Uh, he created the first known crime laboratory in 1810 for the Bureau of Justice uh, in France. He was both a medical professional and a lawyer. So that's where the medical and legal uh, fields come together in forensic science because the gentleman who uh, created the first crime laboratory in France uh, wasn't, came from those two fields. Another interesting thing about uh, Lockhart is a, a theory um, he has, and and the Lockhart theory is the theory of transfer. When two objects touch each other, they take on characteristics of each other. And that's something that I always tell my students is important. When a suspect comes onto the scene, commits a crime, and leaves, he or she does two things. They leave something behind of them, and they take something away from the crime scene. Every single time. Now, whether we can vi visually see that, remain uh, is not always the case uh, and the more we understand the capabilities of science the better we're going to recognize the things that they leave behind and certainly the things that they take away so um, Edmund Lockhart is a very special guy uh, in the history Paul Kirk in 1937 he's one of the men that was recognized as creating the first crime lab here in the United States um, He's been known as the founder of American criminalistics. Now, some of you are going to hear the word criminalistics uh, interchange with forensic sciences. There are some people in the field who, who try to make a, a distinction between the two. I'm not one of them. Uh, uh, so uh, if you hear the word criminalistics uh, um, uh, or forensic science, for the most part, they're one and the same. It's understood that Paul, Dr. Paul Kirk 
uh, cre created the one, first or one of the first uh, U.S. crime laboratories at the University of uh, California at Berkeley. In fact, that that uh, crime lab still exists today and actually examined some of the evidence in the O.J. Simpson case. FBI laboratory was created, which is the largest, not the first, but the largest uh, in the world. And that was created in 1843. Interesting, uh, when the lab was first created uh, during the, uh, the Hoover days, you couldn't be a scientist working in the laboratory unless you were an agent first. So if you were a, a scientist, a chemist, a biologist, whatever, and you really wanted to work in, work in the FBI crime laboratory, you had to learn to be an investigator first. Not a bad idea, except uh, a lot of training uh, went to be an investigator when we could have had them in the in the lab doing other work. So uh, I believe it's important for scientists to understand the investigative process. I don't think they need to be an investigator, and that's the case today. Uh, the, FBI, the scientists in the FBI laboratory, for the most part, were hired as scientists to work uh, in the laboratory. Supreme Court in 1966 really made forensic science where it is today, at least in the United States. Uh, in 1966, there was a, uh, a crime bill, the Army Bush Safe Streets Act, that um, focused on, uh, actually the crime bill actually was in 1968. The Supreme Court decision in 1966, uh, which was very important, um, uh, determined uh, that uh, people's rights had to be read to them. You have a right to remain silent. Anything you say can or be used against you in a court of law. That was the Miranda warrant. Uh, when that happened in 1966, law enforcement said, oh my gosh, who is going to ever talk to us after we advise them of those rights? Well, they were surprised. More, more talk than, they, than they, they thought would. But because of that Supreme Court decision in 1966, now remember, we always had those rights to remain silent. We, but the Supreme Court in 1966 said we, that we had to not only tell them those rights, but we had to make sure they understood it. And because of that, there was a new emphasis on physical evidence because there were less confessions being made. And law enforcement was forced to uh, truly understand uh, physical evidence as best they could. So in 1968, when the crime bill um, actually was passed, we had a, an agency called LEAA, the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration. It was a part of the U.S. Department of Justice. They uh, created, uh, they changed the, uh, they revolutionized the criminal justice system. Uh, they put a lot of money and, and had a lot of federal funding and grants for creating crime labs. They, we now have over 350 crime labs throughout the country, and the, the crime bill of 1968 really started that. In fact, criminal justice programs around the country. Uh, we have them today because of this crime bill. Before 1968, we had criminal justice courses, we had criminology courses, but we didn't have curriculum, we didn't have degrees. You couldn't get a degree in them. But because of uh, the, the crime bill and the need to professionalize law enforcement, um, we, uh, we started uh, doing that. Sir Alec Jeffries developed the first DNA profiling test in 1984. Ladies and gentlemen, this truly made a significant difference in the, in the forensic sciences uh, community, thanks to uh, uh, Sir Jeffries uh, in England. Prior to that, uh, biological fluids could not identify one person to the exclusion of all others. And uh, because of DNA, uh, which by far is the most valid and reliable physical evidence that we're now presenting in a court of law. Uh, now, uh, it has really revolutionized uh, investigations, how we investigate, how defense attorneys uh, approach the defense of their clients because of, of this evidence. So uh, during uh, the course of our, uh, our shows, we'll, we'll, we'll certainly be talking about that. Now, why is forensic science so popular? You might think it's because of the CSI show. But it really isn't. It's because of this guy, O.J. Simpson, in 1995. It was his trial that really put forensic sciences on the map. It was after the show that the CSI show became so uh, popular. Uh, and it truly is today. And that's why we have so many different shows. 
why is Forensic Weeks uh, different than um, any of the other uh, shows that uh, we had? What's different is that this show is only going to talk about what's real. And I want to make sure that I, uh, I'm back on again. Is that right, Tim? Yep, you're back on. Absolutely. Very good. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we only have five minutes left uh, here, and I hope that we've uh, wet your whistle a little bit and hope that uh, you believe that uh, ForensicWeek.com is something that you're going to want to tune into uh, every week. Uh, students that are out there listening uh, who are wanting to learn more and more about forensic science, I guarantee you that every week there will be new and exciting things to learn. Uh, those of you who are in the profession who want to learn new tips, etc., if you can't listen live on a Thursday night from 7 to 8, remember that all the shows will be properly cataloged. Tim, that's going to be your job to make sure that when they get on the uh, ForensicWeek.com uh, site that they can see what the uh, each show is about and what the, the basic content is so they can pick and choose what they, uh, they want to hear. Uh, okay, uh, Tom, is there going to be a way for them to see... Uh like the schedule of our guests in advance. Is, there, is it going to be like a blog or anything like that, maybe? Um, let me just say that tech, I'm sure we uh, that's going to happen. Uh, as soon as we identify how we're going to do that technically, uh, we, uh, we'll, we'll make that happen. Uh, and, uh, and, and, again, technology is a wonderful thing. Uh, I, I use technology, but uh, all the things going on behind it are not something that uh, I'm always... Uh, that familiar with, but uh, Tim uh, Tim's job is to help uh, focus on that, and uh, he, he's going to be working with our guests and getting them comfortable, getting them up here. And I want to hear from the audience if, in fact, this is a show that you believe is uh, could be important and uh, is important to you, and you want to hear from a certain area of forensic science. Please send us an email. You can either go on uh, forensic. Uh, IQinc.com, which is right on my uh, lower lower third. When we refer to lower third, that's that name thing that's below my uh, chin there, face. Um, or uh, you can send an email to uh, Tim, uh, and uh, Tim will. The uh, next time, will Tim will have his lower third on with his uh, with his uh, email address, etc. Because we want to hear from you. Now, right now, you can comment within. Approximately three or four minutes after we go off the air today, uh, you will uh, be able to see um, the recording, but and you'll be able to comment, write comments below. So right there, you can put them there. We'll be able to see them very easily. I guarantee if you have a, a forensic question, if I don't have the answer, uh, I will get the answer for you. Uh, and uh, besides me, I have a, there's a number of students who will be working with me uh, this next semester that uh, will be involved. Again, uh, they're excited about doing it. They have a lot of energy, and um, uh, we'll get that answer back to you. If you want to see a guest, you got a name of a guest you want to see, let us know who it is, and we'll try to find them. Uh, a certain area that we haven't talked about yet, uh, but there's plenty to talk about in this business, and I guarantee you every week uh, we'll, uh, we'll make sure that uh, uh, you are satisfied with what you hear. But I want to thank you very much, those of you, uh, especially my colleagues and friends that I emailed um, this week. And I, I apologize. I probably should have put all those email addresses in the, the blind column. And my daughter, Caitlin, and, and several people have already told me, don't do that again. And I apologize for those. Uh, but if it got you here tonight and you're listening, uh, then it was worth it. Uh, hello to all my uh, relatives up in Massachusetts, Olivia. I hope you're all watching. I was told you were going to, and Nicholas, and uh, and all the rest of you folks up there. I uh, thank you very much, Tim. Uh, thank you. Any last words for you, Tim? I got nothing. Okay. Very good. Did you do that? <laughs> yeah, I did. That. Okay. Very good. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. See you next week.